You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 484 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined this week by Mr. Fosma Mood and Seth Miller. Hi, guys. Sir Seth Miller. No, 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 no. Lord. Definitely not. I haven't bought that yet. <laughs> um. So, Qantas, doing some interesting capacity shift. Uh, yeah, turns out China's not really back, huh? Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Well... I mean, it's China back. I would say that's actually a pretty safe bet. The answer is no. But, yeah, yeah. Um, they are the latest to say, to, to acknowledge that and are pulling back on some of their Shanghai capacity and shifting it to the Philippines. Hmm. Which is interesting. Yeah. Our own. We've, seen a, we've seen a lot going on in the Philippines. I mean, United starts a flight to Manila. Um, there's, I think, a lot of growth in the Philippines, it seems like. And it's... It's interesting to me because it's not what I expected necessarily, but maybe the Philippines is, you know, Duarte is gone. Maybe things are better. Well, somebody has to go visit all the call centers. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I think no. less of that is over there, but yeah. There's a lot of call centers in Philippines, actually. So it's just, no, I, mean, I know there, I mean, there always were. I feel like some of that's come back on shore, but I don't think not. It's, it's interesting. Anymore. We've, we've also shifted a bunch of our like IT support operations to the Philippines. My company yeah. has. Um, where it's it's not like they're doing calls, but they're doing like support functions for like back end systems and things like that. So it's it, it's weird, but um, but I I don't think this is that kind of demand though, Foss. I think this is like there's legitimately a lot more travel to the Philippines with O and D and you know that kind of thing. It's probably look, the the front cabin is probably filled by people who are going there for trade, whereas the back is probably the air traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends and relatives. So I suspect it's a mix. But if the, the front cabinet economics didn't work, I didn't think we'd see such a shift. Well, in for Qantas, right, they're shifting capacity specifically from Shanghai to the Philippines, right, Seth? Like that's yeah, it's not like all of China. China. Is that because they don't have a, anywhere better to put their plane? Right. right. Yeah. Philippines is a reasonably small; it's a much shorter route than Shanghai, so they can turn they can turn it around much quicker too, so they can get more cycles out of that plane. That's a good point. It is a much shorter flight for sure. Couple hours, thousand miles shorter. Yeah, um, but yeah, you do get some additional use of shuttle. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm assuming Manila, obviously, but uh, or not obviously, but I'll say it out loud. Um, yeah, no, I, listen, I think that we we continue to see a lot of questions about demand from China, and with especially to the United States, with the limited number of slots still, it seems like any of that growth would be sixth freedom, the connecting traffic. Yeah, right. So. Any growth there would is assumed to be Chinese airlines undercutting the rest of the market on Southeast Asia and South Asia to United States flow. And I certainly understand the US carriers not wanting to see that capacity return when they aren't going to make any money going into China, but uh, especially since they can't overfly Russia. Yeah. Uh, but I am a little surprised that the Chinese market has not, outbound tourism market has not recovered yet. I mean, it is it is a little strange. I, I I would have thought we would have seen the tourism boost kind of, you know, before COVID, kind of like that right at the beginning of COVID. They were talking about all these Chinese tourists to Europe. And, you know, that, that was like a big spread of COVID at the very beginning, right? Like people yeah. going from China to Europe uh, and the U.S. And now it's just it hasn't come back. And it's it's a little weird. It's just I'm, I am surprised. Yeah. Um, but is it because is it has it not come back because immigration on the other end is harder, like on the Chinese on the Chinese side or or the other side, uh, like wherever they're going is harder. Yeah, that's I mean it's a good question. I don't. I mean, has it gotten harder? Like the U.S. hasn't enforced any further Chinese immigration rules, right? No, but how long are they taking to approve visas? No, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I know for my colleagues in India, getting a U.S. visa is a year long affair now. Yeah, so, so there you go, right? The visa processing has gotten has increased drastically. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the flip side of all this, uh, Philippine Airlines is actually entering a wet lease agreement with Wamos Air, the European charter carrier, for I think it's two or three. Uh, it's two A three thirty two hundreds to operate Manila Sydney and Manila Melbourne uh, for five months. I think this is mostly because they have a bunch of maintenance that they need to do. And so this is the easiest way for them to fill that gap. But I found I did find it 
funny that they specifically focus on Manila, Sydney, Manila, Melbourne, not some of their other routes where they use, you know, where these plates can be used. So just, just a little tidbit. Yeah. I mean, that's again, though, right. It's the right duration, right size plane for pushing capacity to the market. I actually, I wonder how many seats the one most planes have, because that's, if I'm, let me pull this back up to so that. Those routes are about just under 4,000 miles. Yep. 3,800. Right. So they're pushing the limits of single aisle. Especially mm-hmm. if you go high density, say, I guess the Neo could probably do it even full capacity. So when you start thinking about like Cebu Air or something like that, which has said explicitly they don't want to do long haul routes, they want to keep their regional market running. Yeah. Um, and I have no idea if they actually serve those markets. I'll pull it up while we're chatting here. But uh, just it's, it's interesting that like you start to, you know, I guess Philippines Air probably has a cargo operation also. So, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get Syria. I'm up here. That's okay. Yeah, I just thought it was a, you know, when you posted the link to the, or the, the topic for Qantas, I thought it was an interesting juxtaposition for Philippine Airlines to be doing that. Yeah, yeah Cebu does fly it. Um, and so looking at the current month, May 2024, uh, Qantas is flying, uh, let me show destinations here so I can see which mar- markets they are. Qantas is basically flying a daily Manila to Sydney. Mm. Philippines Air has, uh, Almost daily service to Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, 24, 22, and 19 flights. So that like six a week, five a week, and five a week, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Cebu has a combined 35 to Sydney and Melbourne. So hmm. daily, like one's three days, four days a week, and one's five kind of thing. So, or three. Uh, so, yeah, I could, but uh, so Qantas is really trailing in that competition in a lot of ways. Yeah. So that maybe they're trying to catch up a little bit, and they see this as a uh, as a as a time to do that. Yeah, but to see, um, let's start like jump push it out to November. Uh, similar numbers, so I guess this have, all haven't loaded yet. Um, hmm. But yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, but that right the the Cebu Pacific is especially interesting to me just because they're doing that on single aisles, and that's that's a no, they're not. Hey, they're using their wide body. They have. Sorry, they're using their four hundred and sixty seat three three nine. Huh? Wow. That's a lot of seats. 459 seats. Whew. So that's a lot of lift. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. so I could, that that explains why then arguably the others need the additional capacity to try to hold onto that market. Hmm. Wow. Um, fascinating. So let's talk about Frontier. Uh, I think they were in the news this past week with some changes to how they're doing business. So they announced it as the brand, the all new frontier, more transparency, more customer friendly. Um, and in some ways, I agree with that. I was busy uh, when the announcement came out, so it took me a while to actually process it all, which turns out is good. I'm not just having a hot take, weird. Yeah. Um, so, one of the main things that, that, yeah, the first thing on the list of whatever that they announced was transparency affairs. And so they're sort of getting rid of all the nickel and diming, but also not really. Um, you can buy a basic economy ticket still, and it is what it is. What You know, no frills, no nothing. And then on the first page of search results, you now also get prices for the bundles. And so it's an, a, an economy bundle, a premium bundle, and a business bundle. Okay. And the bundles are very similar to uh, the works and the perks, which were the old bundles they sold. Um, but it's all of them come with an assigned seat now, uh, depending on which bundle you buy, you get a regular seat, an extra regular seat or business seat. Okay. All of them come with a free carry on only business comes with checked bags. So you still can have that additional upcharge. Um, it's, there's some real interesting bits about it, but at the end of the day, it's still to me, just, you know, it comes across as it's still fair bundles. It's just, they're just putting them out there more clearly at the beginning in terms of figuring out pricing. So I like it, but it's not all that much different in my mind. Yeah. Um, they're all I mean, so change fees. They're getting rid of change fees. Yeah. Huh. So, I mean, are you, I mean, is that getting rid of change fees for all fares or is it only the bundled fares? Only the bundles. So basic economy still is not a nothing, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the rest of them are, uh, are allowing for, no change fee up to 24 hours before departure. So it's still a limited. Uh, so if, you, if you, if you like are 12 hours out and you, you know, are sick, you're going to pay a change fee. Uh, 
you, I think you just lose the value of your ticket, but, right? There may be a fee. I haven't figured that out. Um, one or the other, either way, not great. Also, uh, if you change to a cheaper ticket, you do not get a credit. Okay. Which is a bummer. But, um, so that, yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, what were the other things they're doing? They're bringing back their call center. They didn't have a call center? Explain nope. that. They had text-based support. Ooh. And what's super fun about that is like, last time they did something, when they announced their new business seating arrangement, me and John Walton both reached out to their text chat to get uh, a, an answer about their uh, passenger size seating policy. Mm-hmm. If you have to pay for advanced seat assignments and got different answers. So we're still not sure which of us was right. <laughs> Uh, uh, gamer roulette yes um and so that's an interesting one um only for uh issues within 24 hours of travel and elite members other than that you put your you can call in and they'll put you on a call back and they'll call you back when it's convenient for them when it's convenient for them you know like when they're not otherwise dealing with people who are traveling real time but you you can't just wait on hold if you're not traveling within 24 hours um and then what was the other thing they uh it's one other thing I thought that was interesting about it. Sorry. Uh, it was uh, oh, the award pricing. You can buy you can buy bundles on the awards now, too. Mm-hmm. So when you book an award, the the, cat, the miles price never changes. It's the uh, the if you want like business, you pay the same number of miles and you just pay the extra hundred and something dollars. Hmm. Oh, the best fair guarantee. Yeah, this is garbage. <laughs> I like how you say that to yourself. You're just like, yeah, it's garbage. I'm reading through my notes and reminding myself of things. Um, Is there a side note that says garbage? uh, It actually says designed to never pay out, but uh, (laughs) and it's in bold letters. So they're they're offering. It's interesting, you know, very much a marketing ploy, but it's an interesting positioning. We will guarantee that we are offering the best price on the route of any airline. So it's not just that they won't change their prices; that no one else is offering something cheaper. And to get to the fine print, it has to be same number of connections. It has to be same approximate travel time, time of day. Mm-hmm. And there's it's unclear what that means. Like, you know, what's the leniency they're going to give? Is it one hour? Is it four hours? Whatever. Um, and you have to find uh, substantially the same seat and seat and the seat products much, must have matching characteristics, which I could see them using to be say like, oh, we offer X leg room and you found something for Y. So, you know, no. Uh, although everybody else sort of offers more. That's what I was going to say is like, what if, what if it's better leg room for a cheaper price? Yeah. Um, and then, but, uh, they do say though, that if you, you can, it doesn't have to just be the, you know, big line advertised fare. If you have to like assemble an ancillary bucket bundle and put it together, get the right number and it still comes out last, they'll at least consider honoring it. Um, hmm. So if you can get through all of that, and if you can get them to confirm it, and they, you know, has to be more than a day before departure, 48, hour, 48 hours with them booking, there's a, there's a bunch of other little bits of fine print, they might pay you 2,500 mi- miles, which, mm-hmm. you know, nice $25, I think, I think it's a penny a point for them straight up-ish. Uh, oh, no, it's not, because their awards aren't fixed price anymore. Um, you get your 2,500 points, which is great. You can do it once. For the life of your account? Per calendar year. Oh, okay. But still. Per calendar year, once. Why even bother? Because it looked really good in the marketing until you start reading the fine print. But just the amount of overhead to to support this, because people will make the claims. Yes, and they have, like it's just silly. They're going to waste so much time, right? Even if they're going to deny it, they're just they're still going to invest time in it. Yeah. Well, they got they got to fill those call center people's time with something. If You're assuming calls. that they aren't going to cancel flights and have people calling them trying to get rebooked. I uh, I'm just saying, we you'd have to actually like advertise that you're still you're having a call center. Yeah. <laughs> there. Um, they also had a whole bunch of trouble implementing this to the point that they were offering uh, negative priced rewards. There are some rewards listed as negative one mile and negative one dollar. He would not let me book, sadly. Um, I also found a uh, 20,000 mile award with a $20,000 fare bundle attached to it. Lovely. Could go to, if you bought business, it was $20,120. Um, yeah, good times. I mean, listen, I, I think this is a good thing. Like the idiocy around the fair guarantee, notwithstanding, it's nice to see, uh, vaguely pro consumer changes that are easy to make it easier to do the fair comparison on the fly, so to speak. Right. Like it's easier to look at the price and know what you're going to get and how, what you're actually going to pay for the thing rather than having to like 
select a flight, log in, give them all your personal information, and then get to the ancillaries page where you find out that you don't actually want to pay that. So that's, I mean, one of the things I saw, one of the comments I saw was like, this is basically killing them as a low cost carrier. Like they're no longer a low cost carrier. And I don't think after what you've explained, I don't think that's the case at all. Like, I, I think, right. And so I went through that same cycle. Uh, Jason, actually, Rubinos and I were like, wait, are they just a normal airline now? And sort of, yes, because mm-hmm. you see it up front. But and in some ways, it's actually better than the legacies because you get that bundle number on the first results page. Yeah. So they're, uh, they're making it a little more clear what you're getting. Yeah. yeah. But it's still bundles and ancillary to everything and different model, and, you know, whatever. So I, I actually, I think this is really customer friendly. The one thing I'll say is the numbers aren't going to show up in OTAs or meta search engines and mm. the advertised fare in some cases, like, you know, uh, the base economy fare, basic economy fare on Expedia for some of the flights I was looking at was significantly higher than what Frontier was selling directly. So, uh, you might not actually see the, if you're doing a third party search, you might not see the real price, but if you go to the Frontier site, you will. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I kind of get why they're doing that, but at the same time, if you're, if you're, you would think they would want to put that, you'd want to publish that everywhere else, right? Like if it's that much better or if your price is more attractive, you would well, want that to be out there. You'd want it to be in a meta search engine, but not on an OTA. Yeah. 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 Cause you're losing money. money to sell through an OTA. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if the meta search, if there's a fix, you know, what their business models are, but, yeah. um, no, I, I think this is actually really good. It's also, there's a thing going on right now. You know, we've had the, uh, the FAA rule about airlines have to give refunds if they cancel your flight or delay it more than three or six hours that we talked about last week a little bit. Um, for a couple weeks, we talked about it. There's a separate bit of legislation ongoing about having to share what the cost of actually like getting everything you want is, <laughs> not just the base fare on the mm-hmm. first result page. And a lot of the airlines have objected, saying it's impossible to get all that information on a single page. Arguably, the way uh, Frontier is approaching this with the bundles is at least saying, you know, if I break it down into individual, you know, 100 individual components, sure, that's impossible. That data would be terrible to render. But it's, you know, when the when the FAA only requires it for a couple core characteristics of the trip, these bundles might actually qualify and they're sort of showing a different way of doing the business. Now, they, they have a different set of things that they can offer relative to everybody else or to a legacy, right, with as multiple cabins and things like that. So... Who knows? But this is an interesting take. Wow. Yeah, we'll see how it goes for him. I mean, maybe maybe this play pays off. Maybe they uh, see some increase in revenue. We'll, never, we'll, we'll we won't know for a while, right? So, uh, well, they're already on sale, so we'll know. I guess okay. depends on you know. We'll we'll Next hear quarter. something. It'll be six weeks. So it'll be half of their Q two. So we'll yeah. hear something. But yeah. exactly what? Uh, that will right. Most Q two stuff is already paid. Yep. Yeah, it should be. But why? Why make the change? They weren't doing well. Didn't they post a loss? Weren't they the ones we talked about a few weeks ago, posting a loss? Pretty sure they posted a loss. I I think this is basically, well, there's a couple things to think. One is, it's an attack on the other LCCs. It's an attack on Spirit, which, you know, kick a man while they're down. Uh, it's an attack, arguably, on Avello and Breeze, who are starting to make inroads. Avello did a great job on social media of like, huh, you don't have to buy a bundle. We just always have no change fees. Thanks. Um, You know, so... And that was actually one of uh, Mavello's things since the beginning is any ticket is uh, fully flexible. You can always refund it back to travel credit. So, uh, and uh, Breeze is a similar one. Again, like I got to 24 hours out. So that's not up to the rate of the minute of travel. But th- I think that that competition was starting to hurt them a little bit as well. Hmm. So they're just trying to keep ahead or get ahead of... Or catch up. Stay, catch up. <laughs> stay yeah. competitive. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, Singapore and immigration. So Singapore opened up automated immigration not too long ago, and it was only, it was confined to like 60 countries. So you could go through the automated immigration gates, um, and not have to like talk to a, uh, immigration officer. Um, and that's now open to everybody from every country. Um, you can still be directed to talk to a an immigration officer, but you can use this, Im- this, this process that's completely automated. Uh, and it, it seems pretty cool. It's it's off to a good start. I think there's been some kinks getting things worked out, like some people's passports not scanning or, you know, getting yeah, basically getting stuck and needing people to come help you. Um, but other than that, it seems like it's working better than the UK's automated e-gate crap that I think we've all experienced now. So not cool. The UK ones when I've gone through is when they like 
didn't have them staffed and so they weren't open. Well, there's that, or there's the problem. Like sometimes they're getting broken, go, they break, and the whole yeah. network goes down. That happened what last week? For yeah, or or like I've been through. I mean, I think Foz has been there too. When like you go through the e gates, and you might have like a line of like, I mean, they tell you it's fast, but they might have a line of like 500 people, and they only have like four of the automated e gates working. Yeah, I, I which is interesting. I that has to be tied to like obviously someone is manually monitoring stuff as well. Yeah, so there's a staffing ratio thing, but yeah, but the, I mean the problem with the U- UK e gates, if you watch there's a reasonably high failure rate where you get knocked over to the regular line anyway yeah like my passport won't work in the e-gates ever since they ended the registered traveler stuff from before the pandemic oh really yeah so and everyone insists that there's nothing wrong with it but i know that it'll never work in the e-gates and i always just circumvent that wow i mean i've had problems with mine swiping but that sounds like a different issue yeah no it, it's it, and it was timed with because i was part of the uk's registered um uh, traveler thing so you could go through the e-gates before they opened it up um that was pre-pandemic and ever since the after 2020 it hasn't worked so hmm. until i get a new passport it's probably going to continue to stay that way yeah yeah i mean it, it sounds like singapore is doing it all with um i guess pre-arrival data that they have I, like everybody else um and it looks i mean it looks like they have them everywhere that they had the regular immigration gates um, so any of those terminals where you, you had to go through, so scan the passport, stand on the foot pad, get a picture taken. Um, and it doesn't sound like you have to show, uh, a passport to leave either now, which is interesting. So, yeah, I, that's, you know, uh, Dubai was doing something similar, I think, with an, point, not on the archer tunnel, right? So, um, just something else to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I thought it was cool. I wanted to talk about it for a minute. Uh, what's this about the 787 from Austrian not being ready? So it was supposed to fly commercial service on Friday the 17th. It mm-hmm. uh, was supposed to be the first flight. And I've been tracking it because I'm booked on it on the 24th. And, you know, just I like put a flight flight radar alert in for the tail number. And it's doing loops of Leipzig instead of actually carrying passengers. So I assume that's pilot training, right? You got to get a certain number of takeoffs and landings. Yeah. To get certified. And they're working on staffing it up. But I don't know how late it actually is. Hmm. So let me be real annoyed. I have a prepaid hotel in Austria. I don't really have zero desire to fly to Vienna just to... I have zero desire to fly to Vienna. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not in the new seat. Um, so I have to figure that out. But they've swapped it. They've been swapping it at A220. Or, a, or excuse me, A320 or 321 the last couple of days on the Frankfurt route where it was to be flying. I mean, it poses an interesting question. Like, how do you get, you would think if you were doing type certification with pilots, you would have sent them to a training facility with Boeing planes beforehand. So you do, you do SIM stuff offsite. You get them all SIMmed up, but they still have to do a. To be type rated, you have to have a certain number of hours in the cockpit, like in a real plane. Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I mean, that's how it works for, you know, private pilot stuff. Yeah. I, I don't know. I clearly, I don't, but I know, I feel like if it's a, maybe it's different as a conversion training. It could be. Yeah. It could be because it is, they're converting from, what were they converting from? Seven sixes? You think? Pilots could have that or a triple seven. Yeah. No, uh, no, Austrian doesn't have triple seven. That's Swiss. My bad. No, they, Austrian has triple sevens. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay. Seven sixes and seven, seven sevens. And no seven eights. Maybe. And sort of. Um, so we're, we're basically we're crossing our fingers for you to get this plane. Or that I don't and I end up calling our friend Hendrick and going after Thai food. <laughs> and and not and not uh not flying to vienna not having a random extra boondoggle to vienna that i and losing my non-refundable hotel night but whatever <laughs> um i think i could argue that my flight was canceled there you go yeah um probably not in europe anyway uh yeah so and what's really funny is i tweeted about it or xed about it and I posted about it today and austrian social media team liked my posts but did not respond or explain anything <laughs> we agree but we can't comment yeah <laughs> can you maybe it's <laughs> someone noticed i don't know um you'd like to think that like i would have assumed that the many passengers who had booked to try to be on the real original inaugural noticed i don't know maybe they sent them a notice saying oopsie um but like you know listen tr- schedule slip i get it i just i don't want to get screwed by that yeah 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 um let's talk about DCA slots. So we, you had mentioned last week that they had opened up the uh, FAA had opened up slots for DCA as part of a bill, right? There was an yeah, FAA. the new authorization bill uh, 
did finally get signed uh, after we talked about before the episode aired, I think. Uh, so it is law now. It does include five new uh, uh, perimeter buster slots to be added. Yep. So uh, American immediately announced that it was going to fly to San Antonio, the Ted Cruz route, uh, yeah. connecting uh, America's military city to our capital. They really played up that. So they're clearly courting his support. Uh, Alaska Airlines has indicated it wants to fly to San Diego. That's a, that's a weird one, right? Like, right? So you, like, that's that's strange. It used to exist. And you haven't really? added until the merger. Yeah, when they had to give up, yeah, when they had to give up slots in D.C., that was one of the routes that got caught. But it was, that route existed for a while. Hmm. And, and it just, you know, it was in, then they'll fly to both of the D.C. airports. Well, so this is the question. Do you keep Dallas at that point? Do you keep fighting with United? Who puts a 772 on that route just for funsies? I, I mean, Alaska generally doesn't stay in a... Stay in a new market for too long if it doesn't do well so and the reality is there's a very loyal uh, customer base in san diego yeah i just wondered is 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 it enough demand to support a yet you know an extra 180 seats i mean they could connect people through san diego i've actually noticed that alaska has been doing that a lot like they've they have been offering me connections through san diego where i'm like what why why don't super convenient (laughs) excellent definitely an efficient routing they like to make right angles to the east, I guess. Yes. So, dog leg left. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, so who else do you think supplies for these? Because there's five, right? That, that's there's that's the five. Thing. And if I remember correctly, four are supposed to be to airlines that have existing perimeter busters, and one is for a new. Mm-hmm. Um, someone suggested they thought JetBlue would try another San Juan. Okay. Go double daily on that, and if you, I mean, we talked last week about the buildup of San Juan again, and tried to defend that. So maybe. Yep. Um, could United try for LA? Oh, interesting. So United certainly could try for something. Do you go for LA, which is already the most served? I mean, they already have San Francisco, Denver, uh, and they have Denver. They have yeah, I, I think know. they. I think they have Denver. Maybe they don't. Maybe I'm confusing you. I think you're right. I've, I mean, I think I've taken it before. Actually, right. Look, do you see a stage length more than was it? Is it twelve fifty or fifteen hundred? Uh, I think twelve fifty is DCA. I think fifteen hundred is Laguardia. I mean, Frontier serves Denver, DCA three times a day. Doesn't look like you, oh, United has one, two flights a day, it looks like, maybe. I'm pulling it up here. For November, uh, yeah. uh, American has Las Vegas, double daily to Las Vegas, double daily Los Angeles, and triple daily Phoenix. Alaska has daily to LA, Portland, and San Francisco, and double daily to Seattle. JetBlue is daily to San Juan. Delta is daily to LA. So uh, American, Alaska, and Delta becomes three daily combined. Uh, Delta is also daily to Salt Lake. Uh, Frontier is triple daily to Denver. United's got daily to Denver and daily to San Francisco. And Southwest has daily to Austin. Hmm. Where else could you go? Maybe Boise? Uh, I'm just like trying to think of airports. I mean, you got San Diego, you got Boise. Um, what else is big? Well, for Alaska or for for anybody? I mean, like, where else would anybody want to go um, to try? Yeah, um, you could do like Reno or Sacramento. I guess you, you think there's enough of a market for DC to Reno or Sacramento? Maybe Sacramento. I could see over Reno. Uh, I doubt it, but maybe it is the capital. It's like most capitals; you don't want to go there. <laughs> I just I just don't know where else you would where else you would fly Tucson. I mean I can't see there being enough demand in Tucson. Well, if AA goes for it, right? Then anything looks game, right? Yeah, you know, that's a hub for them. They can route traffic up and down the East Coast from there. Yeah, Anch- Anchorage. Would you be able to get enough fuel on a plane for Anchorage? <laughs> as long as you don't use the one nines, right? Let's see. Go with no for that one. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out if there's there, obviously I know there's like most demand unserved route market kind of thing and i just don't i united would have to go to a hub yeah that's why i said la yeah i would i would bet they'd probably try to get put a second on uh, on san francisco first i wonder if alaska asks for san jose hmm. i'll ask ask for san diego they only ask for the one maybe a will ask for san jose um right i just i can't imagine united trying to go to a non-hub market and siphoning off demand from dallas hmm but I, I could see them trying to do a second daily on San Francisco. Is it is it really siphoning traffic away from Dallas though? 
That's the argument. Also, I can't believe United was a seven five three out of Denver. Yeah, and pencil. Maximize the number of seats. Big play. Yeah, I mean, most Alaska's doing seven three eights on everything. So there, and Southwest is a mix of mostly eights and occasionally a G. Uh, United is a max eight to San Francisco and the three seven five three to Denver. Everyone else, American is all three twenty one Neos. JetBlue is a three twenty one Delta to Salt Lake is a three twenty one Neo, and LA is a seven five two with flat beds. And then Frontier is three twenty Neos. So hmm. a little. I mean. I wanted a little surprising. Frontier doesn't put a 321 in with a bigger capacity, but I could. I also sort of understand because they have multiple frequencies. Yeah, yeah, but three frequencies is a fair bit. Yeah. So anyway, it's an interesting market. Um, will be very interesting to see what the other carriers apply for, and if a one someone who's not one of those five, six, however many hours I named one. Two. You know, we we know you know we didn't talk about it. just thinking about this. You said Austin on a Southwest. Yeah. Delta, you know, with their new Austin mini hub, yeah, they could they could maybe go for that. They could also ask for DC to Seattle. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, good point. And I, I could I could see them doing that to give a middle finger to Alaska. I say, who do they want to try to screw? <laughs> yeah. Who's who's more important? Um, and then lastly, so I posted this topic kind of last. Yeah, week. I'm actually glad uh, you did. I thought about it while we were talking too. Yeah, so uh, Swiss has announced a new skin that they're putting on their triple seven Ws. And it's they call it the Aero Shark skin, and it's supposed to help with fuel consumption and reduce drag. Proven, proven to to reduce drag. Uh, so what is yeah. this? What is this do? Yeah, if you, it's, you know, it's a technology developed by Lufthansa Technik Group, um, and it's basically a textured film. Mm-hmm. So we always think of like you have a smooth plane, you wash the plane, you keep it clean, whatever, so it flies better. It turns out that by putting this textured film on the plane. Mm-hmm. it actually reduces drag it has something to do with the way the air flows over like right up against the skin there's always some turbulence anyways and so this like smooths it out by adding a different set of bumps hmm. um and i'm vastly oversimplifying that because i didn't really understand the physics the many many times they tried to explain it to me um and i assure you it was many uh but it, it's a super cool technology they started putting it on their cargo fleet uh i want to say even pre-covid this has been around for a while Oh, um, but it's like it's like adding winglets. It's expensive, but it does pay itself off as long as fuel prices stay high. Um, and so they did their, their cargo fleet first. They were able to demonstrate the actual efficiency with that. And so they put it on their uh, passenger planes. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, the, the shark skin of that slightly rough texture that helps sharks move through the ocean water better. It's the same idea just through the air. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. I mean, it's cool that they've kind of been trying it out. Yeah, beforehand, and they've gotten some data, and I, I'm sure this has been technology that they've uh, patented. Or I are... think Technic has a patent on it, but okay. uh, it's it is a a weird bit that like only Swiss has really taken. I think maybe Lufthansa Cargo also is. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I mean, I guess that's the question: is like, is it a is it a skin that only works on the triple seven, or is that really where they've tested it the most, and so that's where they've gotten the most data, and that's why you know Lufthansa doesn't have seven sevens yet, and they will. Is it is it that kind of thing or or not? Or does it not bind to composites? Oh, that's a good point too. Yeah, so they couldn't use it on a seven eighty seven or an A three fifty, right? And so and uh, like there's probably right if it's expensive enough and there's not enough life left in a metal bodied plane. Yep, you probably wouldn't put this on. Yeah, fair enough. Good point. The real question is: though, Did they have to put a disclaimer that no sharks were hurt in the making of the skin? <laughs> God. Uh, oh, yeah, God. Yeah, and I'm pulling up their page now. Developed with BASF. I was going to say it was three M, so I was close. Uh the it's been on four Lufthansa cargo planes, seven seven Fs, and eleven seven seven Ws for Swiss. And actually, the Lufthansa seven four fours had it um, accumulated a total of fifty thousand hours now. Wow! And they've they've saved approximately three thousand metric tons of jet fuel uh, with it across fifty thousand flight hours. Wow! I mean, it's big. That's really big, actually. Yeah. Uh, a film with a um, this is a quote here. A film with a barely perceptible ribbed texture of small protrusions, riblets, sized in patches for easy and targeted application. The film has millions of these prism-shaped riblets, each one fifty micrometers high. Applied to the aircraft in a specific manner and aligned with the airflow, the riblets achieve efficiency gains by reduced friction, similar to, to those of their counterparts in nature, and can also improve lift if attached on wings. Hmm. Uh, Makes sense, isn't it? Sounds cool. 500 square meters on a Boeing 747-400 fuselage and belly. Wow. 
Huh. Uh, yeah, super cool stuff. Then, like I said, this has been around for a little while now. Um, it was very cool in the house. I guess I my my son. Yeah, they they developed it in 2019. It was ready to fly. Wow. So it's it's the big news here is that it's going on the Swiss planes, and I think this I, that's what caught my attention. You know. Yeah, it's fully installed on the Swiss planes. So they had they had been installing, but I guess they're now done. Uh, fuel consumption drop of zero point eight percent. Um, after accounting for other externalities hmm. on the second World War. Wow. Super cool. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it's just expensive and other that people got to figure out if they're going to do it. But yeah, it's a neat, it is a super cool technology. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, guys. Anything else we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about some extra stuff in the bonus topics. Um, but anything else you want for the main show? I think we're good. Sweet. Yep. All right. Well, for our Patreon subscribers, if you stick around, we're going to talk about Seth's Breeze Adventures, Boeing's annual meeting. Uh, maybe United renewing some, uh, resuming some growth, um, and then a little bit from the Abfest Americas and Foz's love of O'Hare. So stick around for that. Uh, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Happy travels. Take care. See you later.